All right, I am Beak Supreme, and this video will be for the Beaklebotics YouTube channel. It's about quarter after 1 p.m., well, 1.17 on uh, November 15th, 2012, and I'm going to do some video game playing. Um, <clears throat> I'm showing you how to hack Game Genie co uh, codes and things like that. Um, just show you some codes that I had you know dealt with um, on some games now what I want to do is I'm going to put my emulator up here I mean I can go no keep in mind I'm not using Microsoft Windows I know Windows 8 is the newest thing that released you know uh, less than a month ago and this computer uh, which was brand new back in uh, April of 2012 just you know like seven months ago or whatever <clears throat> And came with Windows 7 on there and I got rid of it and put Linux on here because every piece of hardware in this brand new commercial you know computer store-bought computer gateway and all that um, every piece of hardware in this computer automatically works in Linux and I'm using Linux Mint now which is pretty alright I mean there's some other flavors of the GNU Linux operating system that I enjoy but right now I'm using Linux Mint and I'm quite satisfied with it overall I could go through the menu <coughs> and access it each time but you know I don't like that so what I'm going to do I add to panel now notice it's going to go right here and there it went alright this is Beast Nest uh, which is a really good emulator. Um, I'm just going to I'm uploading a video. Um, if my internet seems slow, uh, keep in mind I have 20 megabit um, on the downstream coming into my computer. Um, you'll have to understand my cable modem and my system is a little bit busy right now uploading a video to uh, the internet. <clears throat> Alright. Beast Nest, I found out about it this year uh, in 2012. And if you hear wrestling sound like that, I'm wearing a jacket in my apartment because I woke up this morning and it was, and it was 61 degrees, and that's how I save money. <clears throat> um. Okay, uh, so Beast Nest, you can run it in Windows, Mac, and Linux, but I've only used it in Linux. Um, free open source, all that other good stuff. Um, it's, um, yep, GPL version 3, so it's free, it's open source. I uh, found that I can get it on the Raspberry Pi, and this simulates pretty much all of Nintendo's two-dimensional game systems such as the NES, the Game Boy, the Game Boy Color, Game Boy Advance, Nintendo DS <clears throat> um, Super Game Boy of course emulates Super FX on the Super Nintendo um, and it does um, um, it also does Super Nintendo emulation as you'll see that um, of course these uh, these button layouts uh, unique to the Super Nintendo originally and uh, yep and it's just I, I'm you know I really like JNS on um, you know which is a Nintendo NES emulator on the uh, you know for Microsoft Windows I've used it for just about a decade it's a nice emulator I, it even has Kylera support for like um, <clears throat> Um, K A I L E R A. Uh, all right, here we go. And which I was really looking forward to, but just I was trying to connect to the network uh, one time and play games over a network multiplayer, but nobody seemed to want to play the games I was interested in playing. Um, There we go, JNS was good uh, emulator. So basically, any game that was originally dis designed to um, <clears throat> to um, you know to to uh, 
let's say, for example, uh, one of the Mario games that was two-player. Well, instead of having two people set at your computer and you play it, you can do it like these, um, like these uh, multiplayer games and, of course, first-person shooters and all that, where you're playing as whatever player number and you're on your machine, and then through the Internet, somebody else can be whatever player number, whether it's one or two, and uh, <clears throat> and then they're playing the second person as if they're you know uh, playing on your machine or whatever and taking turns or doing like whatever. It's pretty awesome. Anyway, I don't know if Beast Nest. I well wait. Let's see if Beast Nest has Kylera support. And uh, oh come on, scroll down, you dummy. Um, Janus has it, Jens has it, I've used Jens before, MAME, I've used MAME, it has it, uh, I believe I've used 1964 before, I think, yeah, it's got it, SCNES 9X was a good emulator, uh, I've liked it for years, although for a while I was using the SNES 9K, which is Kylera version, um, yeah, it's pretty good, uh, man, it'd be nice if this was continued, if this project was continued and they had it on Beast Nest. But anyway, <clears throat> um, I'll show you what Beast Nest is like. Um, uh, got a few more minutes left on that. Actually, I think Beast Nest is a pretty nice emulator. Um, Whoa, it's pretty awesome, 100% compatibility. But because of that, in order to get, I guess, that kind of accurate emulation or whatever, that's why it might record or it might require such a high uh, system, uh, you know, amount of system requirements. Because I mean, to emulate a Super Nintendo on a Core 2 Duo, I mean, really, I mean. A Pentium 2, an Intel Pentium 2, or an AMD K62 processor um, running, let's say, Windows 98. <clears throat> so something from a computer from about 15, you know, anywhere from 14 to 15 years ago would be able to emulate Super Nintendo games, for the most part, plenty playable without any real speed problems. Now, a computer from 1999, which had, let's say, a Pentium 3 or, in some cases, AMD K, you know, well, an AMD Athlon, you know, running Windows 98, because that would have been, you know, one of the newer versions of Windows. Uh, you can run, you know, um, Super Nintendo games just fine without any speed problems. Uh, now, if you're doing NES games, now I remember an Intel Pentium. Uh, the original Pentium, you know, 200, 233 megahertz was enough to emulate uh, NES games, plenty playable. Let's say, like, you know, you play them just fine with, like, Windows 95. And with a Pentium 2, or especially a Pentium 3, you'd have absolutely no speed problems at all. Matter of fact, even with a just a Pentium 2 and Windows 98, it was plenty fluid enough. But, you know, Pentium 3 with Windows 98, it was very fluid, um, very good. Alright, one minute left on that. <clears throat> I'm going to um, start up my emulator here and get out a piece of hardware. Now if you hear that, this is my Gravis Gamepad Pro USB model, the um, kind of a charcoal gray. I got it right at 12 years ago in December of 2000. I've had it ever since. Um, one of the best game controllers ever made. It's legendary. My friend Tom, uh, he had one and he didn't really use it much anymore and he still wouldn't sell it to me. Uh, you know, I offered him uh, like 10 bucks for it and he still wouldn't sell it even though he just had it laying on the floor and didn't use it. And then another friend of mine, he had one just like this and it was sitting around for a while. He still wouldn't sell it. I mean, even when you offer, like, retail price for the thing, some people still will not sell theirs. It's just so highly coveted. And, <clears throat> well, just so you know, grab 
Windows Game Pad Pro. Here it is. Well, here it is without the uh, little joystick thing. And then um, here it is with the little joystick thing. There it is. And I've, I've kind of lost it. But it's highly coveted. Oh, yep. See, just so you know. Only the dark gray version had the USB. Now, let me show you. Now, I've got a couple of what I'm about to show you. Now, um, these here. I've got some of the white ones, and they're basically identical except for they do not um, have the USB. They've um, they've got the um, they've just got the um, what's going on over there. No, the neighbors are talking about something. I can hear them really easily. They're talking about, I guess, that fight that happened last week. Uh, but anyway, <clears throat> the um, the the uh, just the Grabs Gamepad Pro looked like it was the same controller, but um, only. Oh, okay, watch it there, buddy. I got Beak Child. He was sitting in my lap. And he got scared uh, by that sound of a vehicle. Anyway, um, Grabs Gamepad Pro has USB, and the um, or Grabs Gamepad Pro USB model is USB, and you can still use it on brand new computers today. Now the original Grabs Gamepad Pro just had the uh, the MIDI or Game Port uh, controller, which is like I think a a DB15 style pin configuration. Anyway. Alright, we're going to load a uh, Super Nintendo cartridge and we are going to load up. Um, finally, getting to this, we're going to load up um, Super Mario World. I know I get like way too much into these um, explanations, but you know, it's just there's reasons why. In, in case anybody is new to this, you see what I'm saying? Now, if you got Game Genie codes to give Mario a high jump, then um, you can play this title screen. And what I'm going to do is I got my Game Genie code book from um, from uh, the early 1990s. But just for the sake of uh, just for the sake of the viewers who want to <clears throat> who want to see the codes, because um, I mean I'm screen capturing right now, so you can't see anything other than the screen. Uh, Super Mario World. Uh, where? I know Super Mario World is in here. Um, whatever, because these codes are, you know, th this is just, oh, they got the second Super Mario World, oh, but they don't got the first one. Wow, Super Metroid Game Genie codes, like, what do they do? Ooh, I'm going to have to try some of these. Um. Huh. Now I want to show you something. Um, you notice how these parts of the code are all um, very uh, similar. Um, <clears throat> um, hold on. Okay, let's see if this will... This will give us what we want. Okay. Yep. Alright. 
going to just kind of give you a little bit of a tutorial about how they work, at least on the Super Nintendo. Uh, we'll just go ahead and tell you on the NES, uh, you know, it, it's it's not too difficult to uh, understand Game Genie codes, but it's really easy, a lot easier on the um, <clears throat> on the Super Nintendo. All right, on the Super Nintendo, these codes usually orient from right going toward the left in regards to general towards specific. Now you look, uh, the life codes are 6F07 and I call them life codes because they affect how many lives you start out with or whatever. <clears throat> okay, notice whether it's 99 lives or one life you still 6F07. So I guess and this all goes into like system programming for you know computer technology and all that um, and you notice what these letters and numbers mean that, that's hexadecimal coding which is very common in computers values 0 through 9 and letters A through F um, just you know it just if you know it represents binary values and all that okay now some of these parts of the code will be a memory address now what Tom says uh, sometimes is that they might also represent an offset uh, within a memory address and uh, <clears throat> so anyway um, but they uh, <clears throat> they tell the system what or the whatever what to access and then usually like a bunch of the code will be addressing like what part of the game ROM to get its information from or to affect and then usually to the farthest left on here for, for Super Nintendo codes is what I've particularly noticed is the value of the effect um, now these here um, will, will um, effect you know it dictates like what you want to change and then the final two left characters um, dictate how much you want to change it that that's just what I've noticed that seems to be pretty consistent alright so life codes starting with life codes alright um, let's see um, start some reason you see the start as C C six and it ends with seven. See it six here and uh, ends with seven. Um anyway, you start to notice these similarities and I guess that affects how you start or whatever. I guess B four seems to be your life codes and particularly uh when you can join it with this here, this whole thing, it's how many lives you start with. Now what you'll see is in this this area here, uh, the first two digits of the or, or the far two left digits of the code affect how the the value. <clears throat> and then um then um um now to start uh on the game how game genie codes work is and, and the way they do their, their coding D is the lowest value of something okay and the whole just how you use hexadecimal coding and all that now usually in computers especially on Intel uh, like desktop computers and all that zero is the lowest value or it represents the lowest value it represents totally nothing you know the whole nothingness and then F is the highest value it represents um, 15 however that F is the final 16th you know value place you know what I'm saying so zero counts as a value I mean it means nothing but it still takes up a place and therefore it has a value but what it means is that you know it, it's essentially empty you know um, but anyway <clears throat> but takes up character place now F is in, in you know Intel um, type of systems you know um, um, like uh, desktop computers and all that, and servers and all that, kind of, anything that the Intel Corporation makes. 
F, you know, usually represents the highest value, and it's um, it takes up the 16th place, but it's actually 15, you know, value of 15. Anyway, now on Super Nintendo, the way it is and with its hardware, D is the lowest value, and then E is the highest. But it, the the numbers are kind of scattered in between. The next smallest value is F. The next biggest value is three, and then what is it? Six is in the middle. Okay, so anyway. Start with one life. Okay. D D B four six F zero seven. Well well B F dash six F zero seven is start with you know, particular number of lives, because you see that's what's consistent all through here. Now, start with one life. Obviously, that's pretty much the lowest that you can start with, and that's why the value is DD. Um, now, um, of course, in these codes, the highest amount of lives you start with um, is, um, is 99, and the value is uh, 1, 4, now one is kind of toward the middle, and then four is kind of toward the the you know, one is toward the middle of the whole range of these these values for this hexadecimal coding, I guess the way it's done on the Super Nintendo. And now four is a fairly small value, um, and I'm, I'm assuming maybe that more li more lives can be gained, maybe or whatever. Now my jump code. <clears throat> Okay, we see your jump codes here, AF6F, but more specifically 2C, AF6F. Um, D is a small value, and then 0 is a fairly small value. Now, he's, okay, super jump. Okay, D is the lowest value. 4 is a really small value, very close to D. Now, I've noticed these jump codes, and I'm like, well, why is he using small values? For something that is um, that it is uh, why is it using small values for something that gives you such a large jump? And I was just wondering if it's maybe I'm I'm just wondering if maybe it has something to do with the whenever you do jump the distance you are from the top of the screen. Uh, I'm not entirely sure. Um, I've done some more codes with uh, Yoshi. Um, <clears throat> now normally it takes uh, Yoshi has to eat five enemies um, to cause him to grow up to be full size. You know, from the time when he hatches out of the egg, he has to eat five enemies normally, and then he will grow, as you'll probably see here. And this, uh, you know, th this is the emulator running uh, Beast Nest, and it's <clears throat> oh, this character is from uh, Doki Doki Panic, also, you know, rebranded for you know in America as Super Mario Brothers Two. Now watch this. Now we're gonna we're gonna have uh, small Yoshi. There, there. He, well, no, he, he, okay, he's the green Yoshi, so he grows immediately. Okay, I'm sorry, uh, my mistake. Um, the blue, the red, and the uh, the red, yellow, and blue Yoshis, they have to grow because <clears throat> they got special abilities. Okay, well, these Yoshi codes. I want to try an experiment to see if if uh, little Yoshi can grow up immediately into big Yoshi um, without eating any enemies at all. I'm going to test out that code, and then um, I'm going to test out that code, and then. Um, because the the Game Genie codebook, <clears throat> it uh, I'm gonna look at it here. Um, I'm looking at it right here. Yeah, these codes are uh, yeah DFCE uh, 64A0. Yeah, the, these codes. Um, uh, I was just reading uh, this code right here, comparing it with the codebook that I have in my hand. Um, yeah, these codes are consistent. Somebody just took the Super Nintendo Game Genie codebook and put the codes into a website. 
Now, I, I was hacking some of these codes, um, and I did a code where if you enter in, and I'll show you, well, later, because um, I want to explain it. I, I created a code, um, okay, obviously, CE-64A0 is, uh, you know, that's the part of, well, you know, the codes that dictate how many enemies Yoshi has to eat. Now, I changed some of these values, okay, um, they all start with D there, um, F is the next lowest value, D and F are the lowest values um, in the way the Super Nintendo hexadecimal coding is done. Zero is a little bit bigger of a value um, uh, here, but what I did is I just experimented, you know, understanding the whole um, how Super Nintendo codes work. And I came up with a code where Yoshi can eat 13 enemies uh, in order for him to grow up. And that code is D2CE64A0. <clears throat> and what that code does, it takes, uh, he has to eat 13 enemies. Now, that seems like a handicap, right? Makes the game a little more challenging. Well, I guess yeah, it can um, it can be interpreted as that. And but however, my goal was to uh, make actually it makes the game a little bit easier. Because let's say if you're doing something in the game, solving a puzzle, trying to get to a, a secret area, or or trying to do whatever you want to do, and you're in the Star World, especially where you got these these baby Yoshi's that hatch out of the egg, and they got to eat enemies so they can grow. Well, if if it only takes one enemy for Yoshi to grow big <clears throat> then you know if you got that baby Yoshi sitting next to you and it only takes one enemy for him to grow big then after he eats that enemy that's coming toward you usually it's these Koopa Troopas and all that if they come toward you <clears throat> and and uh, Yoshi eats them and he grows big then he he's no longer a roadblock so what you need is for Yoshi to eat as many enemies as possible. He'll sit there to one side of you, whether it's the left or the right, and he will keep eating enemies that come nearby. And um, therefore, he becomes like um, like an obstacle, and the enemies can't get around him because he eats them. And this protects you from enemies. And I'll demonstrate this in Star World, perhaps at some point. Um, so it's it's actually a nice little innovative thing. Now, um, what I want to show you is a modified jump code. Um, let's just show you a little bit of, okay, you can play the title screen. I, I told you that you can play the title screen if you know how. Um, okay, we're just going to um, do our configuration, make sure our controller is good. Um, input for SNES. Alright, um, alright, and I'm, con I'm configuring the Gravis Gamepad Pro, one of the most legendary PC game controllers that's ever been made, alright, and, It's really simple. You just click this and then press the button on your controller and it tells it what to do. <clears throat> I don't want any tur uh, turbo buttons. And video, do I want to... Um, Alright, well, maybe I'll make it a little bit bigger. Settings we will go to configuration and scale. Right. Oh, wait. <laughs> um, that's in full screen mode. Um, scale up. Well, anyway. Just do it back to this in windowed mode. Now let's enter our codes. 
tools sheet editor I'm going to put in um does it not have super nintendo codes uh, in? oh okay here it is yeah um here are some codes that somebody had already programmed in this emulator we're gonna put in super jump and we're gonna add codes. Oh, here's those codes. How many? Um, yeah, a lot of these are already in there in the code book. So let's see. Super jump. Let's confirm this with what it says in the code book. Yes, D42CAF6F. And that's what it says right here. Look at the website. I want to say, um, okay, super jump. And we see it here, just to confirm, yep. 42 or uh, D42C D4 uh, D42C AF6F. Yep, it's all good. We'll select it to use it. And let's go do that now. Alright. <clears throat> now we'll watch. Because these cheat codes work immediately in this emulator. Yep, there it goes. Now let's see it played again. Let's see what will happen. Oh yeah, huh? You know, as you can, he'll jump over this. Of course he will. Game over. Oh, that's interesting. It wasn't doing that before. Oh, now I can do it. Crap. It lets me play the title screen. I found this back in the early 90s whenever I got my Game Genie. And I sent this, you know, told, I described this to a Nintendo, and they're like, we don't approve of the use of the Game Genie. Mer, it's not a licensed product. Mer, mer. And uh, there's no music. I have to be careful. I believe this level is called Mondo. Um, it's in the Star World. It's in the uh, and they got color codes for the Super Mario World. Uh, yellow, like yellow Yoshi or yellow uh, Koopa shell, will make you stomp. A blue one will give you flight powers. Green one doesn't do anything. Just like how green Yoshi doesn't have any special powers. So there's yellow and you can stomp. Red is the code for fire. Just as any enemy Yoshi eats, uh, red Yoshi can eat. Whenever red Yoshi see green doesn't do anything special. Uh, Stomped him, he was useless. Okay, red gives fire. Just like any any Koopa shell red Yoshi eats will make him spit fire. Blue, we all recovered that flight. Just like any Koopa shell that uh, that blue Yoshi will eat will give him flight powers. Oh, dude. <laughs> he gets more hair. I remember this is a big deal when it was in the advertisement back in 91 and 92. Um, yeah, you can eat the cactus, dude. And look, there's like there's no gold there at the end. But I believe this is based uh, basically just a segment of um, I think it's Mondo or Groovy, one of those. It's in the Star World. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna disable this code. Tools, G Editor, unload that code. And he doesn't have any special um, like that. I'm gonna get myself killed. Ah, there we go. Game over. Oh, I still play it. Alright. That's weird. That's a Star Road, um, um, 
music. All right, we reset the game. And it's as if we never put in any it's as if we never put in any game genie codes. Now here's the same level here. They probably use some kind of scripting language on this to make it play like a little demo. And see it does what it does there. Now however, I'm going to enter in this cheat code. Now all I did now is enter in the cheat code. You saw it. <clears throat> Ah, uh, it's like it was timing or something. Maybe it is. It's kind of interesting. Because Mario's action, like... Is it a scripting? Or, or Oh, there's that music, because he died. He expected to jump over and go through an area. It's like... I can see how it works, it's just difficult to describe. And, uh, like it was scripted or whatever. Oh, that's interesting, a little glitch. Yeah, I did this years ago. Uh, all you gotta do is put in a high jump code. You know, the use of fire turns enemies into coins. Get that blue. Oh. oh well. All right, let's let's get out of this. No, I'm gonna go through and uh, show you how to play it. Oh, we're starting from the very beginning. Need to get some save game files. All right, need to see about that. Okay, yes, come on. Like, we don't need to see your like long ass like freaking message. All right, welcome to yeah Dinosaur Land. Okay, yeah, I played this game like 20 years ago, and I know how it's supposed to be. All right. Now, what I want to show you is a modified um, cheat code that I did. Well, wait. You know what? I'm going to show you some how these codes work. See the well. All right. See how high he jumps normally. Okay. Now I'm going to show you putting in this code here. Uh, cheat editor. We're going to go for super jump. Oops. Crap. Find codes. Yeah. Um. Oh, well, some people have added in these codes. These were never in the code books. Um. All right, here we're gonna go low jump. All right, here's low jump. And this is lower than normal. I don't know how much low. Um. All right, now we're gonna go for super jump. And we're going to go for a uh, super jump. All right. Let's see what they give us. All right, a little bit higher. Now we're going to give mega jump. It's mega jump and I'm still holding the button even as he's falling down okay the difference between super jump and uh, the difference between super jump and mega jump is okay there's still jump codes uh, as you can see there's still jump codes the difference between super and mega is the value here right in this column here the you know the second character orienting from the left. So character number two if you're reading from left to right. Okay, in in um 
low jump, actually he had, um, whoever wrote this code, to do a lower jump than normal, let me find my, okay. Okay, the smallest effect or the smallest value of anything is D, then the next biggest effect is F, then the next biggest is four, the next biggest is, the next biggest effect is seven, the next biggest after that is zero. So low jump here, the, the programmer, whoever, did a higher value. Okay, well, it's sort of a low medium. It's about quarter way through the whole thing. It's the um, one, one, two, three, four. Five. It's the fifth place from the from the left. So <clears throat> anyway, so it's uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen. So it's a value of one, two, three, four, five. It's a value of five, actual, you know, in you know, in a one, you know, from zero to sixteen, you know, or if you count zero as you know, value one, then you know, then this value, then then uh, then zero on here equals five. Okay, and um, so it's kind of uh, it's it's not exactly halfway through, but it's about quarter way. You know, what I'm saying. It's a core, you know, it's like, anyway, you know, your fractions, you know, uh, anyway. Um, so a higher value in this character here gives a lower jump. Now, super jump. Now, it's, now, four is two spaces over, so this is value, this would equal value three in the whole scheme of how hexadecimal works. And so it's a lower value than, than this one here, yet it gives a higher jump. Now F is the next smallest value in the way this um, Super Nintendo hexa hexadecimal coding, and keep in mind the Super Nintendo uses a, a, a Rico 5A22 microprocessor, which is based on the Western Design Center 65, uh, 65C816, which in turn was derived from the original uh, MOS 6502, which was in the NES. Anyway, um, so apparently in the WDC uh, 65, 65C816 uh, microprocessor, I guess the way their hexadecimal coding looks, I'm guessing that that's the way it is here. Now the only lowest value we can go right here is D, all right, because D is the lowest of the scheme. All right, and I will try that. Um, well, let's first, uh, here's mega jump. All right, and I'm gonna press the button, and I'm holding the button, even though I fell down. Now I'm going to do a different code. I'm going to do my uh, modified uh, jump code, which what I call it is de facto flight. Now what I do is where we start out with their jump code, but I change a value. Okay, D, that's part of the original, but I'm going to go D here, lowest value, and uh, 2C dash AF. 6F. Now this is my own custom code that I did in the summer of 2012. Uh, and I'm going to call it de facto flight. Alright. Now, when I retry this code again, alright. Did I, did I not enable that? Let me just see. G editor. I did. That's interesting. Um, all right. No wonder. That's why it didn't work. I put AF64. I need to put AF6F. All right. All right. Gosh. All right. There we go. Now we're gonna try it. There we go. I'm still holding the button. Now the jump button. Now I just let off. And you still got normal jump ability. You can still jump fairly high, just, just tapping the button. That's... Okay. You still have normal jump ability. I'm tapping the button very quickly. And it's a, a pretty short jump. Now you hold it a little bit longer. And you start to get higher jumps. Okay, hold it longer. Uh, 
before you let off and you get higher jumps and uh, the longer you hold it with with my code the longer you hold the jump button the higher you will go until you reach a maximum height and watch this when you use that you got de facto flight it's you never come down unless you want to come down and I'm little Mario I have no power-ups whatsoever and you just fly over levels with this code and get through stuff I'm gonna go to this halfway point anyway now I got you know I'm Super Mario I'm big and you know you still got your regular jump powers faster here. See, there we go. Y you reach a maximum point and then you can just hover there. And that's what the code's really doing. That's what the code's really doing. Once you hit the maximum height, then you, you basically don't go up any further, but you can still continue on with your lateral movement and that's my de facto jump code that I um, that I developed um, in Super Mario World in the summer of 2012. And uh, I'm gonna go with this here. <clears throat> so you can still play the game normally. You just got to be extra careful whenever you go to jump that you know you don't hold the button for too long. Because, see, I'm holding the button right now, and it's like I'm flying, and it never ends. You see, and you can do it at any altitude, and if you want to go faster, you hold the, the Y button. Okay, look at this. And I don't go up any higher like that because I leveled out here. So your physics engine still works in the game, and you see what it does. Now here's what I'm doing is I press the button, get to a certain altitude, and then you can slow your descent by holding the button. You dictate what altitude you want to jump up to, and you hold the jump button, and then you can descend or whatever. Uh, you just gotta take some practice, but it's a de but it's I call it de facto flight because that's how it functions. Oh, it looks like he is flying. It's just how he jumped. Love his magic beak. He's alien man. Beak! All right. Now shall we continue on okay with the um, with the Yoshi's I don't even need the code book I got it right here alright well wait I'm not in the star world so why well, I can't do that yet um, but what we can do is um, oh Flying Mario. This code can also be used when on Yoshi. Well, let's see what E is on here in this little scheme of things. E is the highest value, okay, on here. And let's see what that person's code does. We shall unload my code and we will put in another code. Uh, Eric Newell, his code. E E. To see, it's it's obviously a mod modified jump code because AF six F as the ending as the uh, last four there. Well, actually, two C dash AF six F is the jump codes. Okay, dash AF six F. Okay. Alright, 
that's what we're going to label it. We'll just make sure my code is disabled. Okay, yes, de facto flight is, is disabled. I wonder when he came up with his code. Alright, I got his code, Eric Newell's code, uh, on here. Beach are magical, he's monkey, he's alien, monkey lord. He's a beaky boy. Very similar to mine. Now he's using the highest values. Well, that's weird. Whoa, he's got a nice code. Freaking A, dude. Come down, come down. Okay, I'm hitting the down hitting the down button and he just kind of hovers okay I'm not hitting the down button I'm not doing anything but holding the jump button well that is pretty cool okay you, you can still do small jumps and uh, all that appears normal what's well, weird it's actually a cool code all I'm doing is holding the jump button. Alright, what I do is I jump up, then I hold the jump button, and Mario soars up like that, and that's the only button I'm touching on the whole controller. And he does that effect. I want to do a short jump. Well, I almost hit the ground. Oh, okay, I'm going to jump up. See. I'm going to almost touch the ground when I'm falling, and then I'm going to press the jump button and hold it again. There we go. Takes off like that anyway. Let's get a running start. Now that is Eric Newell's uh, jump code. And let's see here. It takes me to. Uh, Oh, contact and there. All right, now we're gonna we're gonna go back to my jump code. See what the difference is. Mine of de facto flight. Uh, Eric Newell. Okay, so we're not using Eric Newell's uh, flying Mario code anymore. We're gonna use Christian Noggle. Uh, we're gonna use Christian Noggle, also known as Beak Supreme. Uh, yeah, we're going to use Beak Supremes uh, or Christian Noggle's uh, de facto flight. Alright, notice you can't do... I'm, I'm holding the jump... Oh. And press and hold the jump button. And mine does not do what Eric Newell's code does. Because uh, it's just different. Now what we're going to do is we're going to de facto flight and uh, with mine and it's just basically like de facto flight um, and we're going to since this level lets you scroll up higher and see more of an effect I mean I do like Eric Newell's code I mean it, it will have some important use in just finding out what can be done but I still like my code also um, his code is <laughs> is actually pretty cool and pretty neat. It just depends on what a player is trying to do in the game. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I mean, but okay. The point of this, the point of this video, and what I'm doing is to learn computer science and how this stuff works. Um, cause this this is a fun, interesting, and quick way for a person to become interested in the basic foundation uh, or fundamental principles of computer programming or game system programming since a video game console is essentially just a computer dedicated for the purpose of video gaming um, and uh, matter of fact okay the Super Nintendo use a uh, it uses a you know, a 5A, uh, 
I'm sorry, a 5A22 microprocessor made by Rico for the Nintendo Corporation based upon Western Design Center's 65C816 microprocessor, which I believe might have been in a Apple computer at one time. <clears throat> WDC 65C, oops, 65C8. Okay. Whatever, dude. It's 56C Brawls. No, I don't need to know that. Um, I'm going to look it up in uh, Wikipedia. Okay, W65C. I thought I, I thought I, 56. Oh, no wonder I screwed up. Yeah, Western Design Center based off the uh, Moss 6502 uh, microprocessor that was used in the Nintendo. And um, what what systems were they in? Um, yeah, Apple Apple II computers. Um, Wow, you can play uh, basically, um, yeah, okay, um, yeah, Acorn Communicator used it, the, uh, the Apple II GS used it, Super Nintendo, yep, once again, here we go, um, yeah, interrupts, alright, now, Moss 6502, uh, Bill Mensch made some apparently good stuff back in the day, um and this is the, this is the microprocessor basically the 6502 which is the foundation for the Nintendo uh NES microprocessor um computers and games it was in a bunch of stuff dude a bunch of stuff was based off the 6502 the Atari 2600 had it the original old Atari um Commodore 64 had a variant of it. Um, this one looks kind of familiar. I wonder if a friend of mine had it. Apple IIe, the original computer that I first played around with, like in the like 25 years ago in the late 1980s. Um, um, you know, when I was playing Maniac Mansion back in like 1988 and 1989. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, from the Terminator movie, yeah, this is uh, a segment of uh, Moss 6502 assembly code. Oh, that's pretty neat looking. Um, and uh, the Nintendo NES uh, video game consoles. Okay, where we got Nintendo? Oh, come on! You know what? Oh, Sega, huh? He used it a little bit back in Japan. Alright, school computers. Alright, Nintendo NES, a Japanese Famicom, and the American version, which is Nintendo NES. Uh, let's see, hardware. Um, Alright, yep, Rico 2A03. I did that in a previous video, uh, showed that. Uh, microprocessor is the main processor he's used in the Nintendo. Um, it's based upon the 6502 microprocessor, which is supposed to be really legendary. And <laughs> some of this stuff, I guess, is still used today, like in credit card terminals and gas pumps and all that, like at a, at a gas station. Uh, some of these microprocessors from like 30 and like 30 years ago are still being used today in 2012 in the year 2012 right now to operate like credit card terminals at like point of sale machines and like 
you know, like to operate gas, you know, pumps at fuel stations and whatever. I mean, these things are proven reliable and apparently they're easy enough to program for and whatever. And they've been out and they've been thoroughly tested for years, well, for decades. And they've proven themselves, so I guess they're, you know, they're still being used. Um, now, um, I need to submit my code. Um, Oh, this is a neat code here. Um, I need to submit my code to these people, and um, well, I'm not far enough on this game here to um, on this game right here to. Um, I need to play through it and get further. I don't got enough time for that today, um, and um, but okay, these. They list all of them like that. You gotta put in, yeah. You probably do you have to put in all those codes there. Um. Okay, some puzzles relay on the timer and disable it to continue. Luckily, you can do that with the game, Jane. You can turn off as need. Um. Let's see. Play during a demo. Um, okay, this person, well, obviously after the advent of the internet, they got this, but, um, play during demo. I'm going to take their code right there, and I'm going to try it, see what it does. I'm going to unload my code. I'm going to put in their code here. Um... person credit that's how I'm doing that is like putting their their name in there giving them credit for that and uh, restart the uh, Super Nintendo and see if this is what it lets you do see how this code works <laughs> ha! No. hold on AF6F that looks familiar it's a jump code Fuck, that's weird. It's a modified jump code. So like what does it let you do? Like it won't let it won't let you die. like how do you go through how do you go through a freaking like sprite plane? I mean damn. I mean like now like we do um much de oh wait crap I'm moving my window but it doesn't have to be to GM so you will have unlimited yeah basically and you want to turn off the code also so then you can jump like normal and it's just this person's way of finding a ability to play through the um, to the demo. Skim playing through the demo. So basically, apparently, what a person is ex fuck. Apparently, what a person is expectedly supposed to do is just modify. Um, you just use a modified jump code, or any jump code, to make it so that Mario cannot play like he's supposed to in the game, like in the game demo, so that what effectively what it really does is it disable it defeats the script. Uh, apparently Mario is scripted in this little demo in the attract mode as what it would be called in a um, in an arcade 
um, All right, attract mode is what an arcade game displays when the game is left unattended for a while. The main purpose of the attract mode is to attract passers by to play the game and also might act as a screen saver. Of course it does. Uh, attract mode usually displays the game's title, or uh, the game story is if it has one. <laughs> High score list, all this other stuff. Anything to get people interested basically is what it does. Or additional computer controlled demonstration of gameplay. Yep. Um, so apparently, I guess they use a scripting language or something on the. Um, the uh, the Super Nintendo for the Super Mario um, for the um, yeah for the uh, game demo the PC version okay uh, they can only be seen during uh, a track mode level that level is impossible to be played even with game cheats uh, yeah so it can be programmed and all that um, demo mode um, yeah but anyway um, there's a track mode, so just so you know, you know, when I mention terms and all that kind of stuff, you'll know what it means. Um, so apparently the Mario character is scripted here. And, um, and then you basically find a way to disrupt the script and then you're able to play the level. Because if it were like hard-coded or, well, or whatever to where things are supposed to be a certain way, then that, then there'd be no way to play, I, I, I assume there'd be no way to play the level as it is um, because nothing could be disrupted not even by using a jump code like I had done and like these other people have done and all that so really all you gotta do is find a way to disrupt uh, Mario's gameplay and then it's it functions like as like a workaround to allow you to play the oh fuck the, uh, the, the, the game demo uh, screen um, you know, I'm tired of that. Uh, let's see. Uh, Super Mario World. Um, oh, list of Super Mario World. Okay, Super Mario Wiki. I've never seen that before, but I'm kind of familiar with those kind of websites. Seem pretty interested. Um, yeah. Yoshi's Island, okay, Valley Fortress, no, ah, Mondo, is that, is that it? No, that's not Mondo, okay, Groovy, mm, I'm not sure if that's it, cause it's not showing, uh, Gnarly, maybe, no, it's not Gnarly, that was weird, Tubular, no, it's not TV there. It was kind of hard also. Way cool. No, it's not way cool. It's not funky, because that's like the first one. No, because funky's kind of at night. Outrageous? No, it's not outrageous, because that's got trees. It's not awesome. I'm pretty. No, it's not awesome. Are you sure all those? No, it's not that one. Tubular? No, it's not tubular. Cause it's good. Right, I'm just checking these again. It's either groovy or is it um or is it okay groovy and maybe it is groovy. Um, which one does it show? Um, but anyway, that's that, um, and this video has been about, oh gosh, 10 minutes long, I think, already, um, now, what are the other kind of codes going to modify in there, um, so just some, um, uh, other codes. Okay, Felix the Cat was a really cool game.
Yeah, there's these these games look like they're pretty much the same. Well, I don't got my game gen the, the other code book with me, but like let's see. All right, I'm just gonna unload this. Unload cartridge. We're going to load NES cartridge. Felix the Cat. <clears throat> Magic Beak, blessed alien child. In love with soul till he goes and he dies. But he's immortal and he'll never die because he's full of magic powers in his magic soul. And he's an alien baby monkey man. And I must love him because he is good. Kid, oh yeah. Love the magic soul just like I know you should have did. Oh yeah. Then he says, meow, he's alien boy, and he's full of magic powers and his blessed alien soul, and he brings peace to the world, and he's full of goodness, and you will never believe that because you're messed up in the head. Alright, I don't got any cheat codes on here, so I'm just going to play this game as it is. <coughs> I believe I got this all configed. Um, the, um, oh, the, uh, input. Alright, that's all configed. Yeah. <clears throat> Felix the Cat, one of my favorite games ever on the Nintendo. And they should have, I really wish they would have put it on Super Nintendo too, because they made it really good. Magic B plus alien child. Still using my Grabs Gamepad Pro USB version. Oh yeah, and kill the enemies multiple times. That's pretty beakish. Hit the professor, get an extra life. He is Magic Beaker Child with alien soul. Yes, love the Magic Beaker Child, that is my goal. He's Magic Blessed Alien with powers in his face. Yes, he will bring lots of happiness to the human race. He is Magic Alien with magic destiny, and he has all these powers in his magical monkey beak. Love his soul because he's good, and I must love him now. You kill that tree a bunch of times. What enemy was it that actually? Oh, I remember. Oh, I like this power up. And you need to get the milk. There's actually a bit of backstory on this game. <laughs> not not like for the developers, but for me personally. 20 years ago in 1992, okay, it was the September 92 issue of, Ni of Nintendo Power. <clears throat> and it featured this game. This is the first time I had ever heard of Felix the Cat or anything like that. Okay, and it made me want this game for Christmas. Okay, and I was 12 years old. And, you know, I had my Nintendo, and it was pretty awesome back in the day. And, uh, I'm going to kill that tree. Um, so anyway, I got, um, and, <laughs> okay, so, you know, Christmas Eve of 1992, you know, I'm going to bed, and I was so excited about video games and all this. This is back in the early 90s. And uh, back toward the end of the NES uh, and its popularity, and basically the the first full year of Super Nintendo, and, and it was very successful and a very good t uh, time for Super Nintendo games because a lot of these games made in 1991 and 1992 for the Super Nintendo, in, in my opinion, I think they were really good. Um, 90. Yeah, and 90, you know, late 91 is when the Super Nintendo released. And then 92, and into the early part of 93, it was kind of really the golden age for Super Nintendo. Really, I regard um, the 1992 as like the golden age of Super Nintendo. Because you, you, you got good games like Street Fighter 2 that were released on the Super Nintendo. You also have... Um, um, 
uh, Contra 3 on the Super Nintendo, which I have. You had Mario Paint. Uh, of course, now in 91, you had Super Mario World, which is really good. Now, in 93, they released, um, like in the summer of 93, they released uh, Super Mario All-Stars on uh, Super Nintendo. Very good. Very good artwork. Um, very good uh, reproduction um, of, of the, you know, first Mario game, um, Super Mario Brothers games uh, put onto the Super Nintendo with improved artwork and all that. Um, very good. Uh, and you still had other good games um, on Super Nintendo. Uh, well, in late 91, you had, um, you asshole, I'll kill you. You had um, <clears throat> Super Castlevania 4 in late 1991 on Super Nintendo, but it was featured in the January 1992 issue of Nintendo Power, of which I have that. Um, there were just, anyway, there were some good games that came out on the NES, uh, the Nintendo NES in 1992. Uh, Felix Cat, Darkwing Duck, James Bond Jr., um, oh crap, and, uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 3, uh, Manhattan Project, um, Castle, uh, well, uh, then you also had, um, Captain America and the, and the Avengers, uh, there were some good games back then, um, what the hell, oh, yeah, power saving mode goes to kick in, uh, cause the mouse keyboard didn't receive any input, and, uh, get that out of the way, so anyway, the early 90s, uh, were, you know, an enjoyable time, in my opinion, for video gaming, even arcade gaming. Uh, you had X Men in 1992, um, and uh, in the late 80s, had some good games, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, <coughs> that arcade game. Uh, just you know, because these were two-dimensional games, and uh, just I, I really liked it. The art style, the programming techniques, all kind of stuff. It just the late 80s and the early 90s were among my favorite time periods for video gaming. And, um, anyway, I haven't played Felix the Cat in a while, so, I mean, other than today, uh, November 15th, 2012, so I'm a little bit rusty on it. But I've played this game for, oh, fuck, oh, damn. Oh, I missed my freaking power-up session, oh, well. I don't need it. I'm, is gonna be like some extra lives anyway. You know, I've actually beat this game more times without Game Genie than I have with it. Because this game, like, there are so many opportunities for one ups and, uh, and for extra lives that, like, you don't really need Game Genie. Yeah. Oh, I love it. They can kill the enemies multiple times. It's pretty cool. Remembering which uh, kitties that say Felix there, um, which gives you 500 extra points or whatever. And remembering which uh, professor heads to shoot to get uh, one up. So I'll kill you some more. Fighting against Poindexter. Now I'm not very familiar with Felix the Cat, so I don't know what all these enemies are supposed to represent or why they are the way they are. <clears throat> but anyway. Um Okay, back to my story about Felix the Cat. Um I had asked for Darkwing Duck and Felix the Cat on Nintendo NES for Christmas of uh, 1992. <clears throat> well, you know, I went to bed um, on, uh, on uh, you know, Christmas Eve in 1992, and then I was so excited about what games I was going to be getting because I loved to play Nintendo back then. And the Nintendo had it... Damn! The Nintendo had to take place of my first video game system that I'd ever played, which was the Intellivision, made by Mattel Electronics, 
uh, which is the same age as I am. Oh yeah, and you see this um, see this balloon here that he's got. Well, <clears throat> I um, this is part of my story. Um, I had um, woke up early on Christmas Day at like I don't know two o'clock in the morning or no, was it three o'clock in the morning? Whatever it was. And I was so excited, and I snuck a peek at my presence underneath the uh, tree. I got out Felix the Cat. Well, I got out what looked like a Nintendo cartridge box shaped Christmas present, and then I opened it up just carefully and found that it was Felix the Cat. Uh, what was it? A kind of yellowish box. And uh, it was just really great. Um, and. Uh, open it up and played it on my Nintendo and I got to this level right here and I seen this and then later on Christmas Day I started uh, drawing this um, you know the hot air balloon that Felix rides in which should have been a clue to my well no no it shouldn't have been a clue to my parents uh, that I had snuck and played the game because that hot air balloon was also featured in the Nintendo Power Me uh, magazine in 1992, you know, a couple months before Christmas, so, you know, it's it's no, you know, the fact that I was drawing this on Christmas morning is no, in no way, uh, conclusive evidence that I opened up my Christmas present, uh, <laughs> before I was supposed to. Anyway, I was playing this game, Felix the Cat, and I was so excited about it. And, uh, anyway, um, and it just this is one of my favorite games of all time uh, I don't have it on the Game Boy um, I lost my opportunity I, I found it at a game shop and I don't think I had any money with me at the time now uh, at some other point I'm gonna play uh, Darkwing Duck on here to show you and I have uh, that on Game Boy um, it was a good game. I mean, you know, the Game Boy adaptation was still faithful to the NES game. Um, now, in 1992, they put some games on NES that, in my opinion, are vastly superior to, well, in terms of just... I'm, I'm just saying that they made some good games back then, good level design style, they had good artwork, concepts, and all that at that time period and then they had put them on the NES um, and I, they also you know ported them over to the Game Boy and with a pretty good adaptation but they didn't port them some of these games they did not put them on the Super NES which is weird because this is 1992 this is a big year for the NES when Nintendo is beginning to switch over from uh, from the production of... Come on, get it, get it, get it. Oh, fuck. Lost the extra life. But, you know, Nintendo started switching over to the Super Nintendo, but in the meanwhile, they had some of these games that, in my opinion, were really good. Um, like Felix the Cat and Darkwing Duck are just a few examples, and they did not have Super Nintendo counterparts. They did not release them on Super Nintendo. I wish they had, and I wish that they would have had the same developer team and all that, and that they would have made, you know, the graphics would look better, they'd have more color depth and all that, but if they kept the same art style, gameplay and all that, it would have been really good on Super Nintendo. Um, the TurboGrafx-16 version of, um, of, um, of Darkwing Duck has far superior graphics to uh, any other you know, game version of Darkwing Duck. Uh, however, the gameplay on there sucks. Like, I watched a video a video of it, and I've played it a little bit on an emulator, on a TurboGrafx-16 emulator. Really kind of sucks. The game phys physics engine is just kind of buggy, and kind of sucks. But it looks like a really good game. The artwork is really good. Um, but, um, now on... The NES, the game plays really good. A bunch of stuff's great. It's just a gra and, and really, honestly, for a Nintendo NES game, the graphics are really good on Darkwing Duck. Um, but, you know, you can tell there's system limitations. 
uh, on there and um, so I got me a Raspberry Pi now one of these days I'm going to learn more game programming I'm going to try to bring a bunch of this stuff back um, bring well I, I wouldn't be the only person to help bring two dimensional gaming back from the brink because a bunch of this 3D stuff sucks ball skack uh, and it's just it, it, it's just not very good and it's just a bunch of freaking like meathead games uh, as Anita Sarkeesian of Feminist Frequency would, would say that they're just like or any other feminist bigot would say that uh, that they're you know simply to testosterone pumped and that's one way of expressing it but really it, no it's just games for kind of superficial shallow people and it's not very appealing um, I'm I mean I'm not saying that you know Modern Warfare 3 or you know Call of Duty Black Ops you know would not I'm not saying that it wouldn't be fun I'm just saying that it's not personally appealing to me I mean I used to play first-person shooters back in the day when they were really new on the market back in the you know well even the the mid 90s is when they were really starting to saturate the market and um, and I enjoyed it you know uh, just like in the early 1990s I embraced 3d technology well 3d at that time in the form of polygons rather than stereoscopy which now which that's what the market is going toward now because we've been on three-dimensional polygons for for gosh like almost well for you know uh, more than 15 years uh, but now you know technology has come across an image processing uh, for hardware devices to where you can um, <clears throat> you can have uh, stereoscopy you can you can um, you can process the image and put certain well you know certain lines in it that well you know if you know anything about uh, circular polarization uh, like the real D technology um, used in movie theaters for 3d glasses and all that these technologies are now viable they're on the market and they can be used in conjunction with polygons or anything else to provide a you know a depth perception effect to the viewer or the player or whoever would have be you know interacting with these things. So uh, <clears throat> anyway, and these are nice technologies, but like you know they're they're not by all means like the best route for gaming. Uh, you see, this is a classic game classic now I'm gonna whoop ass on this dude and uh, yeah good I got my favorite weapon I will bust your ass oh man now I'm powered up but I, yeah well, yeah yeah I'm gonna get you again yeah <laughs> my, my technique is when I got the magic hat and it throws out the stars and all that I like to actually Attack as I'm jumping up and it knocks a dude like across the room and it's pretty awesome anyway um, So uh, <clears throat> But you know I like uh, one of my favorite games of all time is maniac mansion I'm gonna play it some more and I'm gonna make some more videos of it uh, Felix the cat is a great game Darkwing Duck uh, Captain America and the Avengers on the NES is a really good game. I don't really much care for the arcade version or the uh, oh, there's it, yeah, did it again. Or you know, I don't really care much for the Super Nintendo version, which followed carefully the arcade version. Now, one of my favorite games of all time is Rocketeer, only on the NES. Well, I mean, I do like it on the Super Nintendo and PC, um, you know, but on personal computer. Okay, let me give you a little bit of history on that. Uh, in, 19, uh, in 1982, which was right at 30 years ago, da a guy named Dave Stevens, who in recent years died of cancer. Um, <clears throat> did he die in 2011, or was it sometime in 2012? Anyway, he died fairly recently, and he created a comic book series called uh, The Rocketeer. And, it, you know... Um, it was about the events of a, you know, 
fictional pilot by the name of Cliff Secord. And, uh, anyway, <clears throat> and, uh, you know, it's about the pre-World War II era, you know, of course, 1938, um, and, you know, finds our, uh, what they call a rocket pack, and, uh, and, uh, <clears throat> you know, meant to be a assault, um, uh, transport, well, a transportation technology for assault, so that, you know, rocket troops can, uh, like, fuck, can, you know, attack, you know, with, with, um, with, uh, the element of surprise and whatever, and quickly, kind of almost like a cavalry type of, uh, <clears throat> Force. And, uh, well, anyway, and, uh, he has to defeat these Nazis and to save the day and to save the girl, of course. So, anyway, um, he made it, uh, Dave Stevens made a comic book series back in the 1980s, and then, um, in the early 1990s, well, in 1991, uh, Disney had released a movie, so I'm assuming they filmed it, yeah, they did film it in 1990, um, and, um, and, uh, so anyway, and, uh, I mean, the comic book, I haven't read it, but I've seen some of the scenery from it, uh, from the, uh, PC game, uh, you know, the P the personal computer adaptation of, uh, Rocketeer, and I think it's pretty good, and it, it probably might be interesting, and, um, and then, now, when they... Uh, in 1991, you know, they put out these Rocketeer video games to correspond with the Rocketeer movie in 1991, put out by Walt Disney. Well, here's what they did. The PC game um, is loyal to the comic book. So is the Super Nintendo adaptation, which came out in 1992. But it wasn't really featured in Nintendo Power because the Rocketeer had kind of lost its popularity due to competition with Terminator 2. Because although I think Rocket the Rocketeer was one of my favorite movies of all time, uh, Terminator 2 did better at the box office, and you know Terminator 2 is a really good movie. I have it on VHS. I bought it on DVD twice. I bought it on Blu-ray, and because it's not very expensive, ironically, for a really good movie that it is, and special editions are always available. It's usually the only edition of it that's available when you go to buy it in a store. <clears throat> anyway, um, so anyway, <clears throat> um, a lot of people were more interested in Terminator 2, so the Rocketeer didn't do very good at the box office, um, in ticket sales or whatever, and, um, but, you know, Walt Disney did the movie of Rocketeer. They did the movie adaptation of it. And in my opinion, they have done really well uh, in terms of making a good movie. Now, they're not, they were not a financial success with the movie. And that's unfortunate because, in my opinion, I really like the way Joe Johnston and, and the production crew and all those people involved made the sets look they they filmed it really nice looking uh, locations like the Ennis house in Los Angeles um and the Griffith Observatory uh they they got some good scenery in there they also have um um well it's a little bit too much of a love story which is dumb but they they did really good um um use of effects in that given the fact that they don't do anything computer generated um, and in the advertisement in the uh, movie trailer they said the Rocketeer uses uses movie magic that we don't see anymore <laughs> and I remember that and um, and it was a really good movie and I've got it three times I've had it on, uh, I've got it on VHS from like back in the day and uh, and uh, then I bought it on blu-ray recently and DVD and what's disappointing is there's no special edition of the uh, well there is uh, sort of a special edition of the movie 
I have the 20th anniversary edition of Rocketeer on Blu-ray, and I was pissed off because there are no special features. No deleted scenes, no bonus material, no interviews with the cast and crew, not even a freaking director's commentary, which almost comes standard on DVD, it seems like. Um, the picture quality is really good. I mean, it practically looks like a brand new movie, even though this movie was released in 1991. Okay, so anyway... The reason why I mention all that is because the only the NES version of the game was faithful to the movie. It followed the movie very closely and really neglected the comic book elements of it. And doesn't follow really the comic book at all. I mean, it's just basically a video game adaptation of the movie. And that's why I like the NES version of The Rocketeer so much. Good graphics, good artwork, good uh, game programming, good... Uh, so much stuff is really good in that. Um... Now, it'd be nice if it, you know, was on a system that had more uh, processing power so they can have better graphics, but oh well. You know, they, they did, the, the game uh, designers uh, and the whole development team did a really good job, in my opinion, on the Rocketeer NES game. Okay? Um, I wish they would have adapted it to Game Boy uh, so I can play it portable, you know? Take it places and all that. Uh... No, they, they put it on Super Nintendo, but they didn't put it on Game Boy. Now, on Felix the Cat and Darkwing Duck, they put it on Game Boy, but not um, but not Super Nintendo. Now, with Contra 3, they ha they originally released it on Super Nintendo. Then a couple years later, or a year or so later, they released it on Game Boy, but they never put it on the Nintendo NES. Of course, Contra originally started out on the Nintendo NES uh, in terms of game consoles, even though it was originally a... Uh, arcade game in 1987 which is right at 25 years ago <clears throat> okay um but they just I've got Rocketeer the NES cartridge I got it twice I got Felix the Cat the game cartridge twice I got Darkwing Duck I got that game cartridge twice on Nintendo NES I got Darkwing Duck also the game cartridge on Game Boy and as you can see I got the NES ROM for Felix the Cat. Um, it's just easier for making a demo that way. Oh crap, I gotta fight that boss and I don't get any power ups. Damn, that sucks ass. Alright, Master Cylinder, he sucks. And yeah, see? Alright. One more of these, I got I get a life and a power up. Alright. So I had ninety nine of these and for every one hundred you get you get an extra life. Okay, for every five of those Felix heads there, you uh, <clears throat> you get milk, and for every ten you get a power up. For every hundred you get not just a power up because you reach you know in units of ten, but you also get a life, an extra life like I just did. And they they are the equivalent of coins in um, super in the Super Mario games, or you know they're just items you have to collect and and reward you for the challenges that you go through. See, once again, on units of five, you get the milk. I'm just really rusty on this game. If I can get two more, then I get a power up. There's one more. Haul ass. There's my power up. Now I'm gonna whoop ass on you. And I got a trajectory, so I can be above you. I got a, a curved trajectory. He's got a straight tra trajectory, so he has to have a line of sight with me. And then I can be above him in safety and drop one of these on his head. And that's the way physics works. Ha <laughs> ha! He was going to hit me too, and I. Oh, I got him! Yeah. Oh, and if you see flickering there like that, that happens a lot on Nintendo games. It's due to too much sprite activity on the screen, not enough memory to render all the sprites per scan line, and all that. Of course, Sega criticized Nintendo really bad for it, but you see, Nintendo, really for a console system, was pushing the, the limitations of you know what you typically see in graphical capability. They really tried to you know develop games outside the hardware bounds, but they made them look good. They, they had the same problem on, on Super Nintendo also, only for whenever they loaded a whole bunch of sprite activity or a whole bunch of sprite quantities or whatever or whatever it would take to use up uh, 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 video or graphics memory. Um, 
on this system, and it can be done really with with any system. I mean, you know, any console system could have had that problem. It's just simply outstripping the uh, or outpacing the, the system's uh, capabilities. But you know, of course, Sega and their rivalry with Nintendo decided to like act like Nintendo was inferior. But even though Sega programmers could have done the same, well, matter of fact, there was flickering like that in some of the Sonic games, especially when you do two-player. It's just it's just a consequence of you know of uh, trying to do too much with the system at a particular time. And but you know people are like Nintendo was stupid. It had a giant flaw. It flickered. Meh. And Sega's better. They don't do that. Meh. Well, it's because Sega programmers did not always load down the system with you know a whole bunch of extra sprites and just you know. Uh, visual activity. No, I mean it happened on occasion, but there's sometimes on the Super Nintendo when it didn't happen. It just depends. Hmm. Yeah, but I just figured. I'd, oh yeah, we're gonna. Oh, this is cool. I like this one. And on this level here, this is the only other power-up you can get. There's only two of them. On some levels, there's three power-ups, or three power levels, you know, for weapons and all that. Uh, yeah, some levels there's three, some levels there's only two. If you do it right, you can bounce up and hit enemies and all that. Alright, I believe I'm done playing. Now what we're going to do, we're going to, um, uh, just going to unload cartridge. And, uh, so I was showing you, just, uh, I'm sorry if the video, uh, uh, is too long. It's just how I do stuff. I got all this information in my mind. I just try to, to express the information, get it out there to just, give off a bunch of information as it is in my mind and all that it's just a you know anyway uh, not everybody likes my style but hey you know the, I mean it just that's what I do you know eventually I'll refine it and all that when I learn more about it I just wanted to um, show you a little bit about game genie uh, code hacking basics um, just like I did uh, last time on one of these videos with Super Mario Brothers 3 and the uh, you know start and stay as Tanuki Mario and all that when I, once I play more, more through Super Mario World and get to the Star Worlds and I can get the uh, the different color Yoshis that have special powers I can show you those Yoshi codes that I was talking about and uh, and uh, let you know why it's actually it can be a good thing when you have uh, higher requirements for how many Yo how many enemies that Yoshi has to eat before he fully grows and just neat little things like that I just want to show you the modified jump code uh, that I did um, um, for the um, for Super Mario World on Super Nintendo and just show you you know stuff that I've learned over the years like how you can play the title screen like that that was before anybody got the internet I mean I was doing this stuff back in like what 93 and 94 you know 1993 1994 and uh, I was playing around and experimenting with stuff back before anybody had the internet really and so there was certain other things you did you know you did more hobbies back then than uh, than people do now anyway <sighs> oh, I gotta go Alright, until next time, I am Beak Supreme, and this video has been for the Beakle, the Beaklebotics YouTube channel. You need to go pet some.